Okay, everyone, welcome to another session. This session is being done by Alex Matthews. Uh, Alex organizes the Wellington Drupal meetups going back to 2012 and also helps oversee development and ongoing support of New Zealand's Drupal community sites, which is drupal.org.nz. He's also the CEO and co-founder of X Equals, a digital agency, and also a CEO of First Plane Games, a game design company. Uh, can I request all the attendees to please ask their questions using the live Q&A button at the top, and we will be picking up those questions at the end of the session and answering them. Thank you. Over to Alex. Hi there, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be with you uh, all here today. Um, I'm speaking to you from the gorgeously sunny blue sky Wellington. Uh, not that many of us um, would know that at the moment, um, given that New Zealand obviously is, is uh, in a rapid lockdown. So I join you from the comfort of my living room. Um, fortunately, I was able to snab these signs just in time to give you the illusion that I'm calling in from a professional environment. Anyways, I'm here today to talk to you about one of our favorite Drupal projects. Uh, we've been working with Drupal since Drupal 5, uh, way back in the day when my co-founder and I, Rox Flame, uh, we're building nonprofit community driven sites using Drupal. Uh, since then, we've came in leaps and bounds. Um, and I'm using this policy project not only as an example of a case study that we're really proud of, um, but also as a case study of a project that sort of doesn't fit perfectly into the Drupal 9 upgrade path. Or rather, it could be a good candidate for legacy support, it could be a good candidate for an upgrade or for a rebuild. And I figured that many of you, especially those of you um, who are on the technical side um, or on the high level business end, uh, will be in similar positions right now, uh, whereby you have got code bases that you've got to make these calls on uh, and give your clients or your stakeholders good information to work with in terms of what the best future for their Drupal code base is. So uh, I assume you can all see my slides uh, and I am just going to start going through them. Um, and Pardon me. Cool. Hopefully that remedies it. All right. Um, so policy.nz. Now, the best thing that you can do to understand policy um, is to go there. Um, so I encourage you all right now in a new tab, um, just pop over to policy.nz um, so you can see what the most recent iteration of the website looks like. Um, so what is it? Uh, policy is a platform uh, for recording and communicating policy information. Uh, and sorry, I've just got a bit ahead of myself because I'll quickly tell you um, about who X equals is and who I am. Uh, Co-founded with Rocks Flame about 11 years ago. Uh, we're based in Wellington and based in Melbourne. Um, we have a large portfolio of non nonprofits and social good clients. Uh, we, we, we tend to prioritize projects that we like to work on. Uh, we're passionate about good governance um, and politics. Uh, we're proud Kiwis, um, and we often campaign for better public services and open data, as many of us in the digital communities tend to do. And we love a good Drupal challenge, uh, which this certainly is. Um, so more about sort of the background of policy here. Um, every presentation I've ever given has always had pixelated memes, um, and I didn't want to stop now. Um, so. I can't hear any of you all, but hopefully there's some giggles happening somewhere. Um, the, the, the do policy, they said, it'll be easy, they said. I think that's the one that the team relates the most to, um, given the, the turnaround on the various policy projects we've done and how technically difficult they've actually been. Um, and here's the meme that really makes it for me. Um, and this is why we're so passionate about the project. We are really, really interested in there being an educated uh, voting community. Um, the electorate needs to know what's up in order to make good decisions. Um, we are loath um, to look at sort of personality politics and uh, the, the rise of, of populism across the world. Um, and we really feel as though policy communication and informed voters um, is actually the solution. Um, and frankly, it's low hanging fruit given that there is so little on the way of good policy communication out there. Okay, so just a quick overview um, of, of sort of what we've used it for, and then we'll start getting into more detail about what this platform actually is. 
So we first built it for the 2017 election uh, for a group of young lawyers who are our clients that we work in collaboration with. It was subsequently forked and repurposed for the 2019 federal Belgian election, um, which was one of the most complicated projects we've ever done in terms of data modeling, uh, because in, in, Bel in Belgium, they have uh, English, French, and Dutch. They've got political parties uh, that have the same name in those different languages, but different policies, if you can believe that, because technically they're different parties. Um, all within a uh, MMP structure that I believe has something like 17 um, different MMP parties. So sometimes New Zealand, we think our elections are pretty complicated, um, but Belgium really takes the cake. Um, and so that was a very difficult project. And I was hoping that Dries would actually be in the audience. Maybe he is, um, because he'll, he'd probably understand our pain. Um, so we're going to look at demos of these in, in, in just a moment, so you can see what they look like a bit better. Um, so, as I mentioned, it was led by a team of young lawyers, um, deeply aligned with X equals values, um, which is why we pounced on this one. Um, privately owned, but supported with sponsorship, including from X equals. Um, we were quite happy to put our time into this one. Uh, some really good editorial recognition. The editor of New Zealand's largest newspaper, The Herald, um, famously wrote that the, the real winner of the 2020, pardon me, sorry, 2020 election uh, was the policy website. Um, and we have been finalisted just recently for the upcoming New Zealand uh, Best Awards in the social good category. Um, so that's that's a real boon for us and our team. And we'll be flying up to Auckland, COVID permitting, uh, later this year to attend that. Cool. Um, so just before we jump into some technical stuff, um, I would like to quickly show you um, what the sites look like. Um, so for those of you who haven't already jumped over to policy.nz, um, this is what it looks like. You can explore the parties, the candidates, the policies, the referendums. We'll have a quick look at some policies. I was warned um, to not tempt the demo gods by trying any live demos, um, but as a few of my colleagues know, I have a high, highly healthy appetite for risk. So here we are in firearms. Um, now all of these are categorized um, by the political party. We can jump through and we can see what the various different parties are saying about these things. We can expand policies and read more about them. We can share them. We can look at the sources and citations. Now we also down here have this amazing option um, to turn off all party names. And this will allow you to navigate um, sort of policy categories or policy domains uh, within a larger subset and do so without actually knowing uh, which political party you're looking at. And this is quite interesting and I encourage everyone to go and do this because you may end up finding that you support policies um, that aren't from your typical tribe. Um, to support them, you can obviously heart them and uh, this adds them to your cart, um, which you can then go and check out uh, at the end, um, I've only added a few policies here, so it's going to be pretty, pretty basic, um, but you get the idea. It'll generate a graph of the policies that you've liked, and you can share those to social media um, should you wish. So that's policy.nz. Um, now I'm going to really quickly show you another version of the code base that we developed uh, called Policy Local. Um, that was for the local body elections in 2019. So here we are. Um, now this is the same Drupal 7 code base, um, but has had some new features introduced. It's more about uh, geolocating uh, you to certain electorates and then allowing you to view policies and candidates within those electorates. So I don't mind you knowing my home address at all. It's pretty public anyway. So we're gonna just bring this up. Uh, sorry, to Watson Street is what I want. There we are. And so what this is going to do, um, it's going to return a, a mesh block from an address uh, finding API. And then Drupal is going to use that to determine uh, what elections I'm eligible for. So the mayor of Wellington, the Wellington City Council, the Wellington Regional Council, the Capital Coast, the HBs, and then we can see a summary here, jump into any one of these uh, and then see all of the candidates and all of the policies 
uh, within those elections. Now, this is non-trivial, as I'm sure some architects in the crowd um, are thinking right now. Um, and you can imagine how much content we actually have. There's about three and a half thousand candidate profiles uh, in the back end here. Um, so an enormous amount of content loading, which is also why our content loading tools are so sophisticated for the site. Cool. So I won't tempt fate too much further with that. Um, but what I will do is show you another fork of the project called uh, COVID-19 Policy Watch. Now, this has been offline um, for a couple of months now, um, so I'm just showing you a testing environment. Um, but again, same Drupal 7 code base uh, repurposed to track the world's COVID-19 responses and policy changes. Um, this is all done as a non-for-profit engagement. Um, X equals donated its, its labor to this one um, because we were all just trying to uh, do, do something useful during the outbreak last year. Um, so this isn't public, um, but I just wanted to show it briefly so you can see how versatile this code base is and how many different things it's been doing. Um, so just looking at New Zealand here, um, since the stops being updated, which I guess was 15th of May, 2020, um, we were tracking all of this data in, in real time and the changes in policies um, that the countries that we were tracking were doing. This has ended up being a repository of some pretty useful information for researchers and uh, I'm not sure if it has a future or not, given it was really just a once-off project, um, but we were pretty proud of what we were able to turn around in a matter of weeks uh, to get this online. So, moving on. Great, so these were the main principles that really drove the development of the site. Um, it really was about journalistic integrity. This is information for information's sake. Um, but delivered in the most easy to interact way possible uh, with um, columns sort of supporting that with privacy and speed and the ability for users to personalize uh, their, their sort of shopping carts of policies and, and sort of, you know, every, every web experience is meant to be unique. Um, we hope that uh, every user is able to sort of have their own policy experience. Um, so, uh, we worked with a team of lawyers to provide all the content, which was essential. Um, fortunately, as the developers, we weren't liable for the content, um, but obviously the content side of it was just as intense as the actual technical development itself. Uh, blinkers mode for turning on all of the political names of the parties. Um, that was a big undertaking. And then randomizing the actual data in terms of how it was ordered. Um, so that we weren't perceived as favoring um, any particular party. So for personalization, uh, we had a goal to create an unintrusive personalization with users never needing to create an account on the site, but retaining their favorites. Um, and again, non-trivial, um, doing all this customization without any user system. Um, so we used Addy, which is an address lookup service to help users find their electorate and candidates. Um, this allowed us to sort of enable users to create lists of their own preferred policies um, and share them with others. Um, and how did we achieve this without user accounts? We stored as much data as possible on the user's end and only collected non-personalized information. So that meant that their, their cookies and their session browsing data um, was doing most of the heavy lifting in terms of personalizing the web experience. Privacy and speed were, were super important to us. Um, I don't think we've ever done as thorough uh, sort of stress testing um, and using automated testing tools as we did on policy. Um, the site actually did go offline once or twice um, during the election, which we considered a huge success, uh, given that it, it, it basically pushed the system as hard as it possibly could go uh, before we had to sort of look at those bottlenecks and addressing them. Um, but again, it was, it was a sign of success. It was a high quality problem because we had a significant percentage of New Zealand's eligible voters interact with our website. Um, I don't know the exact figure, um, so I don't want to be quoted on that, um, but I do believe it was a, a, a pretty substantial amount of, of people in New Zealand um, saw the site or interacted with it in some way. Um, so for those of you who are technical, um, the way that this worked with geolocation was that when the user enters an address, we send a query to the Addy API and receive a mesh block back for the addresses. A mesh block is the smallest non-personally identifiable location metric we had available for then personalizing their data. 
Um, now we added that mesh block to the user's cookie um, along with their matching electorate um, so that uh, we didn't need to store all this data server side, um, which would have ballooned into an impossibly large amount of data um, uh, eventually. So we keep everything client side where if we can until such point um, that the set is meaningful from a statistical perspective. We decided that this would be when the user decided to view a summary of all their policies that they've collected. And at that point, we collect the list of policies mapped just to the mesh block and generate a graph for the user from their cookie. When the user shares their set on social media, it is shared via a URL that contains only the ID for each policy. And this allows us to create shares that are not tied to a person uh, and rather generate the cache on the fly based upon the URL shared and viewed. So that's relatively sophisticated uh, as a solution. And the reason for doing it was just to reduce the possibility um, of users and their preferred political policies um, being stored on, on the server. So the privacy policy is available on all pages um, and really, really clear human readable breakdown of what, what's collected and what's not. Um, because for us being really clear with the user about that, what was essential um, to this whole thing working. Cool, so just looking at some, some core Drupal entities. I won't spend too much time on this, but it's important for those of you who are interested in, in the upgrade. So our policy content type was reused across um, all five policy implementations. Um, the fields that we used were a little bit different. Um, but it, it turned out to be very, very dexterous and reusable. Um, and that was down to the strength of how the data model had been built in the first place. Significant usage of taxonomies, as you can imagine, given how much data needs to be tagged. Um, I'm not going to tempt the demigods too much further, but I will just show you what it looks like to enter in a COVID-19 policy. So here's the back end. Um, pretty simple. Policy ID, the name of the policy, the details the country it's connected to, the issues that it relates to, the date it's announced, the date that it expires, um, if it's been superseded by another policy, and then citations. Now, this was one of the simpler data models. Um, the national elections, I believe, were a bit more complicated, um, but you can see how simple it really is um, for someone just to go in and load a policy. Um, sorry, just coming back here. Um, so there's not too much more to say about this other than that the policy local body um, has quite a significantly different data model in terms of the candidate profiles, um, just given how many candidates we needed to actually cover. All right, contrib modules. We didn't use that many, um, but the ones that we did use, we made heavy usage of. Um, so I'm sure developers in the audience will be very, very familiar with this. Uh, flags module is handling um, the hearts on the cards. Uh, views is powering most of the screens on the website. Um, better exposed filters is allowing us to filter down those views in real time. Um, color box for popping up the policies when you click on them. Uh, display suite goes without saying. I'm not sure anyone builds sites without display suite these days. High charts for generating the charts. Um, and the rest of these modules were sort of managing the data um, on the back end and getting it in there. Do we have any custom modules? Do we have any custom code? The answer is yes, but not if we can avoid it. Um, X equals is quite capable when it comes to developing modules and writing PHP. Um, but for us, that is a last case scenario. Um, it always makes a lot more sense to find a heavily supported community project and give back to that. Um, or use it for what it was built for, um, rather than reinventing the wheel. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but it does need to be said, because to this day, we still see people using Drupal for the wrong reasons. Um, but we feel as though uh, we did well by only needing custom code for retrieving the, um, the mesh blocks and geolocation data, um, the party colors and blinkers mode for turning on and off the party information, um, the swiper JS and the theme layer, um, so that this all works in a tablet, swiping left and right, uh, queuing, oh, pardon me, let's jump back here. Um, queuing user policy data submission for performance, that was really important because otherwise the site would fall over. And moving flags client side for performance as well, which was something that we learned from the 2017 implementation. Cool, um, so what is the future here? Uh, because there is another NZ election coming up. Um, well, this site is a really good candidate for up upgrading to Drupal 9. Um, it would be a substantial undertaking, 
Um, but that said, it also isn't broke. It works great as it is. There's actually nothing wrong with it. Um, if Drupal 7 was maintained infinitely, um, then there may not be any need to upgrade this at all. It would probably be totally appropriate for the next election. However, we live in reality. Um, code bases need to be upgraded, um, and therefore we need to make a decision on what to do here. So I know that everyone always prefers to a fresh build. Um, I certainly do. Um, it would be great if we could rebuild this from scratch and migrate the know-how and logic rather than migrate the code. Um, I think that's a really important point here because as, as many of you I'm, I'm sure are aware, you've all had, all had the experience where you sit down, you write, let's say a document, and then you accidentally have the power cut, you lose all your work um, and you've got to start from scratch. Doing it the second time round, you often do it in half the amount of time and you do it better. Um, and web rebuilds aren't particularly different, I don't think. Um, so I would love to rebuild this from scratch if we could, um, but it would also be the most expensive and time consuming option. Uh, and naturally, if you're the client and you've invested all this time and money in developing a product, um, you want to make the most of it. And that's something that we, we fully support because that is the promise of Drupal as well. So is legacy support, support an option? Um, well, absolutely it is. Um, some suppliers, uh, Acquia predominantly um, are, going to be, are going to be supporting Drupal 7 well into 2025. Um, is the pricing public or available or easy to understand? No, it's not. And that's not um, unique to Acquia. That's all the di various different people around the world saying that they'll provide Drupal 7 support. It's actually really hard to find out what you should expect to pay, um, which means that you should expect to pay a lot. Um, we've got the next New Zealand election in 2023. Um, we hope to be covering it with the system, so something needs to be done before then, um, with the kill date for D7, uh, at least in terms of community support, uh, being November 2022. So the chronology here does force us into needing to be quite strategic. Now it's going to be a losing battle long term to support this on Drupal 7, because we won't be receiving all the benefits of Drupal 9, um, it'll become less and less secure over time, it'll become less stable, uh, and we will just be really swimming upstream um rather than just taking advantage of, of modern technology so we're not in the business that x equals of maintaining drupal core we're honest with ourselves about that um, and we'll be advising the client um, that this solution might be cost effective for a year or two it might get us to 2023 um, but if they want the product to have any continuity beyond that then they should consider a rebuild um, or a fresh build really soon or an upgrade i should say so this here i think is the favorite option a d7 to drupal 9 upgrade uh, we've done a few of these at X equals. Um, most of them have gone more or less to plan. Um, there's a little bit of, of friction, um, you know, broken views, um, front end tweaks. Um, that's to be expected, as I'm sure we're all aware. Uh, so I put down here probably the best option, but like all sites in the situation does require an investment. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been in the situation, especially those of you who are client facing, where the client just doesn't understand why they need to pay to upgrade a bit of software, especially if they've been using it without errors for years. Um, and you know, a, a good argument needs to be made um, for why, at, at least while technology is still evolving, um, we need to constantly be rebuilding it to stay up to the play. Um, and I think our client understands that, um, but the cost savings here aren't dramatic. I think maybe 25% maximum cost savings in terms of doing the upgrade versus a fresh build. Um, pros and cons, a fresh build in some ways would allow us to move faster, um, but the Drupal 9 upgrade um, will give us hopefully most of that work out of the box. It's actually quite hard to tell, um, but my, my, my guess would be that the upgrade will be 25% more cost effective and more time efficient uh, than a fresh rebuild. So brace yourself, a new policy is coming uh, one way or the other. Um, we feel like the site is too good not to hold on to it. Uh, the site is relevant way beyond New Zealand. Um, in fact, any MMP democracy uh, can benefit from this. Ultimately, these are always client decisions. They need to do their cost benefit analysis and decide on what's gonna be most appropriate for them. Um, but I, I was really hoping to use the last part of this presentation um, to ask you all what you think. Um, and get your active feedback on this. Because I think, as is often the case with Drupal, there's a million ways to skin a cat. Um, and sometimes there isn't one particularly right answer. There's just a complicated set of pros and cons. I think that's the beauty of Drupal, is that there's so many different ways of doing things. 
um, but I also understand the, uh, the tyranny of having too many options available. Sometimes it's nice when decisions just get made for us. So I'm really keen to know from those of you in the audience, um, what do you think? Let's share our knowledge about this. Um, what do you think about policy? Do you think it has applicability outside New Zealand? Can you imagine this working in Australia? Um, what do you think about the idea of us investing as, as societies um, in educating our voters um, and, and working backwards uh, from people be, being motivated by understanding policy um, rather than tribalism or personality politics um, or just going along with what the people around them are saying uh, versus taking intellectual responsibility uh, for understanding what you're actually voting on and how it impacts you. Um, I know it's something that long term we hope uh, continues to be a focus of democracies globally. Um, but watching the world as it is now, um, it also seems a little bit utopian in some ways. So I would, I would really love to know what you all think. And uh, with that, um, I believe we are heading just into our last couple of slides here. Um, yeah, questions and answers. Actually, Alex, I do see a few questions. Do you want me to go through them? Yes, please. Um, if you can spread them out, we'll just um, take them as they come. Sure. So Karina Deliano is asking, what is the API that you used? What is the API that's used? Yes. Um, there, there, there's at least one API. Uh, the first one is to the Addy address API, um, which is returning the geolocation information based upon street addresses. Um, that's basically what you can see um, on the policy local site when you type in your street address and then it returns that based upon the postcode finder. Um, I don't think we're using any other APIs than that, to be honest. Um, our main solution architect and co-founder of X equals Rocks Flame uh, would be the better person to answer that. Uh, but to my knowledge, it's just that one API that we're using. Oh, of course, sorry, Google Analytics API um, is always in there somewhere as well. Of course. Uh, the next question is by Griffin. He, this is fantastic. Thanks for sharing, Alex. Yes, I certainly see this having a place slash value in Australia. I know that ABC does something similar close to state slash federal elections. So this is not a question specifically. It's more of a compliment for you, Alex. Well, that's lovely to hear. Well, thanks for that, mate. Um, and, and to be honest, that is what we've heard uh, from pretty much everyone we've shown this to. I've shown this to uh, people in Europe, um, in the States. Um, I've got friends in Canada who are wild about it. Um, and a lot of people want to sort of take this back to their countries and make, make it real. I think the, the burden for a lot of people um, is finding someone who's motivated to actually get all the policy content together, um, to vet it legally and be willing to stand by it. Um, and uh, I also have to be clear that this is um, owned by our friends at Policy Limited um, who paid us to build this and uh, they would be the gatekeepers to the code base. Um, but I'd be happy to put anyone in touch with them if they're interested, because they are motivated um, by a social entrepreneurial um, approach. And really, it's not about making money, it's about um, educating voters of democracies. Um, so if anyone in the audience is actually serious about doing this in their respected country, which I imagine would only be Australia, um, given, given the audience of, of Drupal South. Um, but if anyone is interested, let me know. All right. The next question is, who did the design slash illustration? Uh, yes, that was in my speaker notes. And I'm really glad that was asked because I didn't quite get to it. Um, so thank you to whomever asked that. Um, Rachel Reeves. Uh, Rachel Reeves is a really good uh, friend of X equals. Um, she was a contractor for us in our very early days. She's worked for a lot of different places around Wellington. Um, and she was one of the founders of Policy Limited. And that's part of the reason why the project came to X equals was because we had that social connection with her. Um, she's a, a really incredible UI UXer. Um, she does freelance work occasionally. Um, and if you Google Rachel Reeves UI UX, um, you'll probably find her. I think um, her, her website is rachel.works um, or, or something like that. Um, oh. And uh, we, we, we foresee future collaborations with her as well. But I also just want to mention that I'm um, finding a really good senior UI UXer is very, very hard. Um, but you can see from the policy site the benefits that you get from doing it. And um, I, I think that us being nominated for the New Zealand Best Design Award um, had a lot to do with her work. That's awesome. So the next question, again, by Griffin, is how have you done the content? Is it manual? 
if you could improve this process, how would you do it? Yeah, right. Um, to be honest, this was one of the biggest parts of the project. It was building all of the feeds and porters. So we use the Drupal 7 feeds module. In fact, the feeds module being stable for Drupal 7 uh, was one of the big drivers for us using Drupal 7. Uh, when we started this project, uh, Drupal 8 had just came out, um, but it was unstable. Um, there weren't many modules ported. And the modules that we really needed, um, like feeds, um, just weren't, weren't working the way that we'd hoped. Um, so going for Drupal 7 was actually about making the project uh, feasible within the, the time frame and the budget that was available, um, because things like feeds would, would take us more time to code from scratch um, than the whole rest of the project. And we are talking about bringing in thousands of content objects, um, including content objects that are constantly changing. So we built a whole bunch of different feeds. Um, the client was putting together a spreadsheet um, based upon a spreadsheet template or spreadsheet templates, I should say, because there are multiple different feeds. Um, and then those were being sucked in and aggregated into Drupal 7 content. Um, quite a bit of fine tuning and trial and error was needed on that. I know that my, uh, my um, co-director Rox <laughs> was up late many, many, many nights uh, working on that. Uh, but it, obviously it saved you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of what would have been an extremely tenuous um, manual content loading process. So the answer to the question is that we turned CSV files or spreadsheets into Drupal 7 content um, by maybe half a dozen quite sophisticated battle tested feeds that not only sucked in new content, but also updated existing nodes. Cool, thank you for that. The next question is by Nicholas Santamaria. He's asking, what are the specific challenges of policy? Oh, wow, there were many. Um, I, I think in most cases it came down to the timeline. Uh, we were often sort of prepared to do the project, but told to hold off, you know, until certain sponsor support was secured. We needed you know, confirmation that the electoral commission or sponsor A or sponsor B uh, was going to come to the party. And so by the time that we were given the green light to proceed, we often only had maybe a couple of months um, before said election was coming up. Um, and turning around, you know, this kind of product in that amount of time uh, with a relatively small team, because uh, X equals isn't huge. I mean, we're only maybe a dozen people. Um, that, that was significant. Um, but in every case, you know, we delivered. We always do. Um, I think that that's just down to the strength of our team and the seniority um, and the, the skills that we have um, as a, a really high capacity um, team. But uh, the timeline was one of the biggest challenges. I think scaling the site to deal with ever increasing traffic um, was definitely a big challenge as well. Um, I know that especially in 2017, um, there were some performance issues that we had to really address in subsequent implementations. Um, I, th I think originally we were storing a lot of that personalization data um, on the server. And so the server just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until I believe we had gigabytes and gigabytes um, of data relating to various different user sessions. Um, now, not only was that an issue in terms of storage capacity and performance, um, but we were very aware of privacy considerations and not wanting um, to hold any data from users, even where it was anonymized. Uh, so rebuilding that to work client side rather than server side, um, that was quite difficult. Um, but Rox and uh, the various different developers he was working with was able to achieve that. Um, so yeah, the big challenges I think was scaling to ever increasing traffic, um, to addressing bottlenecks in the performance, like certain views would fall over unless they were cached really carefully. Um, and yeah, the biggest challenge right now um, is dealing with the fact that it works fine as it is. Um, but for it to have a future, we're going to have to rebuild this in Drupal 9, and that's going to be a lot of work. All righty. Uh, so the next one is by Nathan Dobbin, and he's asking, great site. Pretty sure I used it when it first came out. Do you keep track of policies across elections? Might be interesting to see how policy has changed over time. Sorry, the last bit of that question, you said, um, do, do we keep a track of every New Zealand election? Do you keep track of policies across elections? And it might be interesting to see mm. how policy has changed over time. Sure, thank, thank you. Yes, um, I mean, we don't, X equals doesn't. Um, it's not our place to do that. Um, but the client, Policy Limited, um, certainly does. 
Um, and I think if they keep doing this long term, which I suspect they will, um, then they'll have one of the best data repositories in New Zealand, or in the world rather, um, on New Zealand's political policy data and how it's changed over time. Because if you think about it, um, it's kind of remarkable that every democracy, um, especially Western democracies, aren't doing this already. Um, there's certainly no one else in New Zealand who's doing this. The government itself doesn't do this, um, at least not to our knowledge. Um, so we are building an arc of information here, um, which will only become more valuable over time. And again, it totally blows my mind um, that every democracy doesn't just have this as a public service. Um, and that the Ministry of Statistics or the Ministry of so something or other um, doesn't take this on as a, as a responsibility. Um, and the fact that private citizens have had to come together in order to be able to communicate to the public um, what they're voting for, um, I think that reveals a lot about the areas of our democracies that are yet to mature. Um, so for now, yes, um, all that data will be held by a private company, but my hope is that one day it doesn't need to be that way. All right, um, the next question is by Nicholas Santamaria. It's not a question, more of uh, information. In Australia, the ABC have Vote Compass, which is a similar concept to the turn of party names feature of this project. And then he's also given us a URL, which is votecompass.abc.net.au. The... Oh, I know, and, and that, I'll just say quickly, um, I, I, I will go and have another look at that because I've certainly seen it in the past. Um, but there were several other competing sites with us um, that were trying to do similar things. I think we had votewise.co.nz and uh, oh, there's, there, there was at least one other. Um, where they massively differed is that they were sort of question wizards that would then tell you how to vote at the end. You know, you'd answer a few questions, you'd hit a few check boxes, you'd say how you feel about certain issues. And at the end, it would say, congratulations, you're a greenie, go and vote greens. Or it would say, you're a conservative, that's who you are, go and be conservative. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit reductionist here, but the truth is that how, that's how we saw most of them working on the high level. And fundamentally, we wanted to do something different, um, which was be impartial, be journalistic, um, let mm -hmm. people just consume the data. Um, and for us being able to turn off the ability to see which political parties um, represented which policies, that was really important to us um, as a point of differentiation from those other services. So like, I'll certainly go and check out Vote Compass and re-familiarize myself with that in Australia. Um, but I suspect it's going to be closer to a tool that tells you how to vote rather than a sort of encyclopedia or policy. Um, but I'm happy to be wrong about that. So I'll, I'll, I'll go refresh myself on it. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Uh, the next question is by Sean Hamlin. He's asking, do you store any data server side, even anonymized? Example, number of policy hearts, or was this all tracked through Google Analytics? Oh, good day, Sean. Always nice to get a question from you. Um, look, that's, that's, that's honestly going to be the better question for Rox. Um, so I'll ask him to give you the lowdown on that next time you talk to him. I'm tempted to say that it doesn't include any, any server-side data about the user. Um, I, I, I'm just conscious of the fact that the, 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 I mean, certainly IP addresses would be recorded and there, there, there could be a little bit of other stuff, but um, it would certainly all be anonymized. Um, and we worked really hard wherever possible to store data in the browser rather than on the server, um, especially in the later implementations of it. Um, so if there is any data server side, it'll be extremely minimal. It's probably just session data. Um, but I will uh, take a note of Rox getting back to you um, because I know the two of you are, are very technical and we'll have lots to talk about there. And the next question is by Karina. And Karina is asking, did you do any custom development for the feeds module to work? Or was it a matter of mapping fields to various different content types you have? Do you know if feeds are still a stable module to use in D9? Or is there any other alternatives that can achieve similar implementation of importing content? Mm, oh, wow. I mean, that's several, several great questions. Um, and I, 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 again, I'm just going to speak to my, my sort of most high level knowledge, just so most of you know, I'm, I'm not the most technical person at X equals. I'm more of the business guy. Um, but I, I know enough technically to be dangerous, as we say. Um, so look, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, I don't think we did any active um, development of feeds. Um, I'm sure we were on the issues queue and we may have written a patch or two. Um, that wouldn't be uncommon. Um, but I don't think we did any significant um, contribution back to the feeds module. Um, is the feeds module stable in Drupal 9? Uh, I'm not sure. I'd have to have a look. 
uh, last time I checked in, uh, the, the the sort of the, the, the back end part of feeds um, well, was largely there, but there was no UI for it um, and it wasn't particularly stable. And there was a big sort of rift in the community between using feeds or using migrate API. And I think that the Drupal migrate API um, is preferred by many people in Drupal 9 in terms of sort of moving data around. Um, and again, that's all, you know, command line driven um, and, and isn't quite the same as feeds. Feeds had a great user interface in Drupal 7. It was really easy for someone who's only semi-technical like me to use it. Um, the client was able to use it, um, which was great. Um, but I'd never expect the client to go and use a command line um, for sort of mapping fields across, um, which I think is, is, is the more accepted way of doing it um, in, in Drupal 9. Um, which is the other answer to your question, what are the other competing solutions to feeds? Um, and look, there's, there's actually quite a few. If you Google um, input, uh, import export tools for Drupal, you'll find that there's many, many dozens of solutions. Um, I think for getting data out, uh, various plugins for views are considered the, um, the best practice. It's certainly what we typically use. Um, so there's the views export module, there's the views rest module, uh, and the, the, there's others which will perform very specific kinds of exports. Um, and they're all really, really good for particular use cases. Um, and then the migrate API, I believe, can be used for sort of um, typically migrating entire Drupal projects, uh, but can also be used um, to sort of map data from one system to another. Um, and I think that um, depending upon the developer and depending upon the particular data input or output challenge, um, you'd find the best module for that by just evaluating the available ecosystem. So I'd be Googling Drupal 9 input uh, import export modules, um, and then I'd do a comparison table um, of what they can do and then you know, choose the best of breed um, based upon the particular challenge. So I'm sorry I can't give a more clear cut answer there, um, but like a lot of things in Drupal, you've got to get out there and search, you've got to evaluate the ecosystem, and you've got to make an informed decision based upon the particular technical challenge you're facing. Yep. And the last question here is from Dallas Ramston. And Dallas is asking, empowering, empowering talk, Alex, thanks. How much data needs to be brought over into the new site? If there is not much custom code and if there is minimal difference between a fresh build and migrated site, uh, in my opinion, have you considering considered leveraging migrate API to bring over the data instead of feeds? Gotcha. Um, well, Dallas, haven't heard from you from ages, um, but uh, but great, great, great to hear that you're you're there. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I, I suspect that would be the next step we'd look at um, as part of evaluating a Drupal 7 to Drupal 9 um, upgrade. Um, it may make sense um, just to lift and shift the data and use the Migra API for doing that um, into a sort of fresh Drupal 9 build. Um, that, that would be, again, sort of one of the many options we've got available. Um, and again, this comes down to sort of the, the, the tyranny of decision making, because even under the D7 to D9 option, within that, there's three different flavors of how we can do it. Um, and, and using the Migra API for the data, um, and then otherwise rebuilding the config, um, that could be a perfectly good way of doing it. Um, what I will say to that, though, is that I think most of the secret source in the code base is down to how it's configured. It's, it's really about the features that it's doing and how, how it's doing it. The data itself is almost negligible, um, given that the policy data for the next election will be completely different um, from the policy data for the previous election. Um, so moving the data is less important um, than sort of migrating the features, um, if that makes sense. Alrighty, thanks a lot, Alex, for this great talk. Um, just a reminder for everybody who's attending that at the, uh, that the lightning talks and the roundtable session starts at 2 p.m. AEST slash 4 p.m. NZ. And uh, yep, thanks a lot. See you there. Okay. Thank Bye, you, everyone. everyone. And uh, check out policy.nz again if you uh, if, if if you want to keep it in mind. Cheers. Bye. Bye.